meeting, which will be October 3rd to the 6th. Most can't come in person because of travel, but those who can, who can't, uh, will have a virtual platform available with similarly good content. And again, thank you for participating. And if there's things that we can do to help you out, uh, let us know. And your International Advisory Board is listening to what you say, and we'll be glad to work with you. Thank you again, and congratulations on a great program. Thank you, Dr. Nene. I'm going now to introduce the moderators of this session, Dr. Daniel Lee, Associate Professor of Head and Neck Surgery at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Pediatric Otology and Neurotology at Mass High and Ear in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, Dr. Muaz Taravishi, uh, International Advisory Board Chair-Elect and Co-Founder of the Taravishi Stamberger Ear and Sinus Institute. Dr. Lee, well, uh, thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to participate in this really exciting international discussion on heads up surgery uh, for otology and neurotology. Special thanks to, of course, Dr. Terabishi, to you, uh, Dr. Solovitsky, and of course, to Dr. Denany and the Academy for this uh, incredible opportunity. Uh, so again, the title of our session today is Disruption and Innovation in Otology and Neurotology, Endoscopic and Nexoscopic Ear Surgery, and absolutely excited to be able to introduce my distinguished <clears throat> co-panelists for this morning's uh, session. Uh, I'll be first providing some introductory remarks on the topic of heads up surgery, and we'll transition then to uh, Manuel Fino, who'll be speaking on endos how endoscopy has disrupted her ear surgery routine. And then Dr. Thanamis will be speaking on his experiences with endoscopic and exoscopic visualization at NYU. And then finally, our anchor presentation, as always, will be presented by Dr. Joao Flavio Nogueira from Brazil, on the future of endoscopic ear surgery. And then to follow that will be a panel discussion as well as Q&A &A, uh, time permitting. And hopefully we'll be able to stay uh, on time as best as we can with the presentation so that we can spend more of our time discussing topics and a few interesting uh, cases. And so uh, to more formally introduce uh, my first panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Manuela Fina, uh, internationally known for her work as an educator and an innovator in endoscopic ear surgery. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Minnesota Medical School uh, in the beautiful state of Minnesota, and of course, my hometown as well. Manuela, good morning and welcome uh, again. Great to see you. Our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Dathanimus. He is Director of the Division of Otology and Neurotology at NYU and Assistant Professor at the Medical School. And um, I was very fortunate to participate in NYU's first endoscopic course, I think it was about two years ago, pre-pandemic, and it was really a pleasure to work with you and your team, and you've really done exciting things to uh, push the field forward and heads up surgery for our specialty. So well done, Daniel, and welcome to the panel this morning. And of course, finally, last but not least, a, an amazing individual who needs no introduction. He, uh, in many ways, is responsible for why globally uh, this field is known. Um, his world travels um, uh, circumnavigated him multiple times. His many passports, I'm sure, are filled with stamps from every uh, country on this planet that has an otology practice. Uh, Jean Flavio Nogura is an incredible innovator, educator, and speaker. Uh, he was with me for my first uh, Harvard endoscopic course in 2014. Uh, Jean Flavio, good morning. Welcome. I hope all is well with you and family in Brazil. And back to Pablo. Well, I think we're going to start the program. Uh, Dr. Fina, please uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Pablo, I believe we are going to start with uh, just a brief introductory talk by myself, and then we'll transition to Manuela. That's okay with you. Go for it, yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> Uh, so once again, good morning uh, from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and again, uh, we're excited to talk about the uh, current state and future of heads up surgery for otology and neurotology and incredible interest in these global grand rounds. Uh, for this session, we have now 1,090 plus registrants as of this morning. And so congratulations to the global grand rounds team for making this a reality and for doing such amazing marketing uh, of the special educational event. And so again, I'll provide a brief introduction to endoscopes and exoscopes for otology to provide um, a foundation for continued discussion as we move on to the next uh, three uh, speakers. 
These are my financial disclosures of which one, 3 t Medical, does produce a FDA-approved technology that is used in endoscopic ear surgery. I will be uh, discussing the general topic of this technology, but I will not be using any brand names or logos throughout the entire presentation. And so there are three main options for surgical visualization and magnification in our specialty. The first, of course, is our microscope, which has a 3D image inherently due to the binoculars, uh, a longer focal length of 20 to 50 centimeters. It is a line of sight approach, meaning that if you want to look around the corners, one must do bony dissection as well as soft tissue dissection. Conversely, the 2D endoscope, which in most cases refers to the Hopkins rod telescope, has a much shorter focal length of one to three centimeters. The visualization occurs by looking up at an hd 4 k monitor, and you leverage the benefits of a small form factor endoscope to be able to uh, use a smaller surgical corridor and uh, look around the corners uh, because the lens is at the tip of the scope and is a fisheye lens providing a wide angle view of your middle ear anatomy. And then finally, the 3D exoscope is very similar to a traditional microscope. An exoscope is an extracorporeal scope or digital microscope. It does provide a 3D image if one chooses to do it. Um, a longer focal length of 20 to 50 centimeters, much like the traditional microscope. And the visualization, much like the endoscope, uh, is obtained through an HD or 4K monitor with or without 3D glasses. And so you can switch back and forth between 2D or 3D. So microscope, endoscope, and the exoscope. And the last two will be the focus of our discussions this morning. And so endoscopic and exoscopic ear surgery are examples of heads up surgery. And why do we have to think about this? Why do we need to care about this? Why is this likely to disrupt the field going forward? And this is really inherent to the poor ergonomics associated with modern microscopes. The stack height is just becoming a greater problem as more uh, technology is being packed into our current uh, microscopic technologies. And so on the left is Nick Dewyer. Uh, he's a neurotologist at the University of Arizona performing during his fellowship in Boston, a left-sided transmastoid dissection. We've optimized his ergonomics. He's in a surgical chair with armrests. Um, he is um, positioned looking forward. Uh, but again, for this average sized male surgeon, he's still reaching out to be able to dissect. And that puts strain unbearably in the upper shoulders, neck, and back. Conversely, looking back in time to a true innovator in our field, uh, uh, Dr. John Shea, who developed um, in the 1950s and 60s a modern stapedectomy, Dr. Shea performed thousands and thousands of middle ear operations in his day, uh, but his ergonomics were vastly different. And the main reason for that is the difference in stack height. And by that, I mean the, the, the distance between the oculars and the lens of the microscope. And so John Shea actually enjoyed a stack height of less than half of what Dr. Dury and all of us have to experience in our ORs today. And um, as someone who runs a fellowship in neurotology here in Boston, I oftentimes joke that the reason we have fellows in our field is so that I don't have to drill out the internal auditory canal because the ergonomics when working with the neurosurgery through a retrosigmoid approach with a semi-recumbent or um, reverse Trendelenburg position is extremely uncomfortable for us as part of that surgical team. And so the ergonomics have been influenced by the the increasing stack height, which comes with more technology. So more isn't necessarily better. And in this case, a stack height is becoming too high, too large. I passed by one of my uh, colleagues' ORs to watch a brilliant uh, surgical fellow performing a cochlear implant on the left side of this child with hearing loss. And as you can see, uh, this person's arms are completely stretched out. And how could you possibly ask your trainee to perform a very ultra-fine task as well as this person can when stretched out like this. This is not a safe and efficient way to take care of our patients. And what is the way forward clearly is heads up surgery to avoid the stack height problem. And so heads up surgery to the surgeon's head is positioned up and looking forward. And in our field, otology and neurotology, we're talking about endoscopes for small surgical corridors through the ear canal, or even through a canal up mastoid uh, approach and exoscopes for open surgical corridors, a newer technology in our field for cochlear implant surgeries, for canal down mastodectomies, or for craniotomies. And I look, and I look forward to hearing Daniel's comments on uh, this topic in his presentation later this morning. And so why did I begin using endoscopes for my otology practice? Well, the view is just superior to the middle ear compared to the traditional operating microscope. <clears throat> As a trainee at, at Hopkins in Baltimore, uh, with my colleagues studying for our board examinations, so oftentimes the structures of the ponticulus and subiculum were mentioned in discussing chronic ear disease. 
but no one had ever seen it in the operating room ever. And so we looked for an image surgically of these structures, could not find one in any textbook. This was the only figure I could find in all of my studying. And this was a beautiful line drawing taken from a Shuknik textbook from 1995 that depicts the ponticulus as well as subiculum. And in fact, this image uh, lacks some accuracy, uh, if you will. And uh, these structures now in the ORs today are evident and clear to everybody in the room. And so this is a left ear transcanal tympanotomy approach. This is gonna be uh, anterior and posterior, showing the long process of incus, tympanic facial nerve, the stapedial tendon, and the ponticulus. The ponticulus in Latin means little bridge. And indeed, this is a little bridge of bone between the pyramid and the promontory of the cochlea. And it helps to define the antero superior aspects of your sinus tympani. And we see the structures without any bone removal at all, just on tympanotomy with a zero or angled endoscope. Another case from our practice of left-sided tympanotomy for uh, conducted hearing loss, showing additional anatomy, stapedial tendon, tympanic facial nerve, long process of incus, the undersurface of the manubrium, the tympanic membrane, the funiculus. The funiculus is a bridge of bone between the promontory of the cochlea and the hypotympanic air cells and actually frames a very special set of a special surgical corridor that we call the subcochlear canaliculus. And this subcochlear canaliculus, if you dissect it immediately, can take you to the petrous apex if your jugular bulb and carotid artery are cooperating, which oftentimes they are not. <clears throat> and then this is the fustus, one of my uh, favorite surgical landmarks. And especially for cochlear implant surgeons, the fustus is highly relevant. The fustus, um, which had been described in a paper by John Naparco back in the day when he was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, is very relevant for implant surgeons because it is coplanar with the floor of the scale of tympani. So for CI surgeons out there listening, if you're lost in the middle ear trying to hunt down the round window, find the fustus and it will take you home every single time. It's a really great bony landmark. Never was mentioned to me in fellowship and residency, and we see it all the time in routine tympanotomy cases. And then of course we talk about the subiculum, which is a continuation of the posterior pillar of the round window niche and uh, defines a boundary of the sinus tympani, the ponticulus once again in this case, and then the sinus tympani of the retro tympanic corridor. Another case of the left ear uh, looking superior anterior. And so this will be anterior, posterior and superior and inferior, showing anatomy that I'd never saw without a canal down mastodectomy. And here we can clearly see with no bone removal at all, the cochleiform process, the tensor tympani tendon, and the cog, which separates the anterior attic from your supratubal recess. All clearly seen and very easily with an angled telescope through a transcanal approach. Same case looking now more posterior inferior using a 30 degree telescope, showing our again our sinus tympani, our ponticulus, that bridge of bone between the pyramid and the promontory of the cochlea, the subiculum. Uh, again, looking further now inferior, showing the round window niche, the fustus, and the funiculus. This is a view that I never saw without a canal wall down mastered approach, as well as additional drilling of the anterior canal remnant. Uh, this is a left ear transcanal endoscopy with a 45 degree telescope showing the area just past the protympanic space, the eustachian tube, the internal carotid artery, the promontory of cochlea and the semi-canal of the tensor tympani muscle, easily achieved visually with an angled telescope in a transcanal case. What endoscopic systems are used for endoscopic ear surgery? Well, most of us use a Hopkins rod system with uh, a 2D HD system or 4K3 CCD camera. And I'll tell you that uh, 2D HD is more than adequate for all of our middle ear and skull-based needs with the endoscope. But 4K is obviously great if you have it at your institution. We, uh, if ideal, ideally we like to use a three millimeter diameter by 14 centimeter length uh, Hopkins rod. But of course, if you're just getting started, uh, using your traditional rhinology scopes, four by 18 centimeters is more than adequate for cases in which the ear canal is not too small. And of course, most of us began using traditional ear instrumentation. You do not need to buy anything additionally to begin endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, another uh, 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 idea that's um, that that is brought up in our, in our 
meetings and courses is these are short scopes that maybe you already own for otoendoscopy. These are not helpful for endoscopic ear surgery because the bulk of the camera does not allow for sufficient room for the other hand to get into the ear canal. So short scopes are great for examining the ear and documenting the exam, either in the OR or the clinic, but not for actual endoscopic ear surgery. That's what's new in the field. You know, we're talking about disruption in the field, and perhaps this might be the use of these distal chip systems for middle ear surgery, which we'll focus more on during one of our panel topics. And this is a new class of systems that are disposable, have lightweight form factor, a small diameter, and have a built-in suction to enable the surgeon, the operator, to use two hands, one for the suction and scope, and the second hand for your dissecting instrument. <laughs> And so what about exoscopes or digital microscopes for otology and skull-based surgery, as shown here? Well, the exoscope is not something, a name that we manufactured recently. This is actually a, a term that was coined back in the early 90s in the neurosurgical literature. And the first paper I could identify was in 1994. And this basic system essentially was an endoscope or camera mounted extracranially or outside the head, hence the term exoscope, extracorporeal. And it was mounted over the craniotomy site and the um, surgical field was then projected onto a video screen upon which an overlay of digital information, whether it's imaging or other graphical information was used to help guide the neurosurgical team to perform a less invasive tumor uh, dis uh, dissection and uh, removal. Fast forward to 2019, we published our first experience using exoscopes during a trial of several systems here in Boston in the White Journal. And so, to um, uh, provide the, the punchline, and um, this is a survey-based data, we concluded that exoscopes are associated with a lack of neck strain and fatigue compared to the traditional microscope uh, when looking at uh, a comparison uh, with um, the traditional uh, microscope uh, in a variety of mastoid and skull-based cases. The image quality trended towards better imaging quality uh, for the uh, operating microscope, and I think it's, at this point in time, very difficult to compete with ground glass optics. But the video systems are improving as we get from 4K to 8K to 16K, I think we'll begin to see some really important steps in improving the image quality. But I do believe that these systems are good enough for main, uh, mainstream use today. And finally, my one slide uh, in referring to the uh, global events. Last uh, spring uh, here in Boston, we performed an exoscopic and endoscopic assisted approach for resection of an endolymphatic sac tumor. And the heads-up approach enabled a much safer environment for the team in the room. We could use a, a barrier drape to contain aerosols. And we completed the entire craniotomy and endoscopic resection around the labyrinth without any need to bring in the microscope. And so once again, the heads-up approach has enabled full use of IPPE, which makes it safer for the staff. And so I briefly conclude, Endoscopes for small corridors and exoscopes for large corridors are truly complementary modalities. Uh, these technologies, the exoscopes specifically, are really designed to replace the binocular microscope. Ergonomics unquestionably are superior with heads-up approaches compared to the microscope. And heads-up surgical approaches, I believe, have already begun to disrupt our field of otology, neurotology, and skull-based surgery. Thank you. And uh, with that introductory uh, presentation, I wanted to transition the virtual mic to Manuela Fina. Dr. Fina, welcome again and good morning. All right, good morning. Oh no, she was clicking Good morning to all of you. Are you uh, seeing my slide? Good morning. Um, thank you, the organizer, and uh, um, Dr. Tarabic and Dr. Lee for inviting me to join uh, our, uh, this uh, global Grand Round. I will talk to you today about how endoscopy disrupted my ear surgery routine. I'd like to extend a warm greeting to all of you watching um, in, the, now we're in the rest of the world. I'm uh, uh, talking to you from Minnesota, where we're enjoying a 
really nice warm uh, end of summer, fall, and I will uh, soon get ready for a really cold winter that here lasts more than uh, six months. Today, um, I'll go over and I'll try to convey to you my journey from uh, um, my routine in ear surgery, where I was very comfortable, into a new journey where I learned uh, new skills. And I'd like to thank uh, um, Dr. Tavarbici for his uh, teaching and all the members of the International Working Group that uh, have uh, really provided me with uh, a new discovery and uh, new learning. So I received a traditional education in otology, and like general surgeons um, say often, if you think of a trach, do a trach. Um, I was uh, kind of trained that if you think of a mastoidectomy, do a mastoidectomy. So for chronic otomastoiditis, I would approach it with a mastoidectomy. A cholesteatoma for the most the totality of the cases, I would approach it with a mastoidectomy. And uh, sometimes even a failed uh, tympanoplasty, I um, would start to think that maybe a mastoidectomy would improve my success by providing ventilation, uh, more ventilation by doing the mastoidectomy. So I was uh, uh, setting my ways. I was very comfortable. I received a good teaching and I had reached a very nice level of confidence. I had an established your surgery routine where I knew my limits for tympanoplasty and uh, when to proceed with a posterior auricular incision rather than a transcanal approach to a large perforation or an anterior perforation. And uh, when it was a time for a cholesteatoma, my main dilemma was whether to keep the canal wall up or if it was a case for a canal wall down. And in between, there was one option that if the disease was in the sinus tympani, I would have to probably move to a facial recess approach. So if I had to summarize in one sentence uh, what has been the shift and what has been really um, the, the change from uh, um, microscopy to endoscopy, I would say that endoscopy has shifted the focus from the mastoid to the middle ear. And uh, as in uh, often uh, many um, new uh, changes uh, translating this 80-20 law, is not just the amount uh, of time, but it's also, it's really about uh, the focus and the concentration and our efforts dedicated more in the middle ear. It's also a situation that translates into the timing of when to um, uh, do our surgery. And as I was, uh, I used to start most of my surgery with a mastoidectomy and then move forward to the middle ear and attic work and closure. I now start almost the totality of my cases with an endoscopic approach and then moving to a mastoidectomy. And so at the core of the discovery of endoscopic ear surgery is really the understanding that about the, um, the ventilation pathways from the middle ear to the attic and rediscovering concepts that had been introduced to us by um, in the literature by um, uh, otologists such as Palva or Proctor, but didn't really quite make it into our core uh, training because at that time the drawings were um, uh, difficult to understand. We didn't have a comparison of endoscopic surgical view. Sometimes the drawings were taken from cross-sectional slides of temporal bones. And so um, really about how the ventilation pathways um, of the middle ear, it's really key about uh, the pathways of the, um, the, the main ventilation of the eustachian tubes, the, the eustachian tube into the, from the attic to the middle ear, we have the uh, pathway of the tympanic isthmus. And uh, um, as you can see, um, in um, endoscopy, uh, the key is about uh, always making sure that these uh, pathways are free. You can see the anterior epitympanic isthmus um, that is, uh, um, as we can see, uh, boundary by the um, cochleariform process, the tensor tympani tendon, the incus, and the uh, posterior tympanic isthmus, whose boundaries are between the incurious tapedial joint and the posterior 
um, the posterior uh, scutum. So in the middle here with an isthmus blockage, uh, my approach was a little different. I have to admit that sometimes uh, I encounter the isthmus blockage uh, first uh, with a mastoidectomy and finding a granulation tissue that uh, often after cleaning the granulation tissue from the aditus ad antrum, I, was, uh, I would uh, utilize a, um, a, a, an instrument such as a Whirlyberg to uh, just make sure that this passage was clear and utilizing saline to flush it. And then I would move it to the middle ear where I would describe granulation tissue in uh, um, the middle ear and the removal of adhesions. And also part of my training, I also um, used to cut the uh, tensor tympani tendon uh, in an effort, as I was taught, to um, free the uh, manubrium of the malleus from medialization. Uh, where in reality, I would say now that this was an attempt to improve the, the, the um, opening of the tympanic isthmus. However, um, uh, and sometimes this led sometimes to a premature decision of removing an incus in order to remove and open the pathway of ventilation, where in reality, uh, then we would have to deal with a more complex situation of reconstructing the ossicular chain. So, um, the effort now is really, as we know that the tympanic isthmus needs to be open, we have a more of a focus transcanal to perform a small aticotomy to dedicate our time to removing granulation tissue and webbing. And then uh, once we have identified our, our clean pathways, um, also uh, utilize a saline with a curved suction to flush the, the mastoid, where often you can find a, a blocked um, mastoid with a retroglade flow of mucus that was trapped in the mastoid. Another advantage of endoscopy is really the inspection of a protein panic area. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, an example of a left ear with a very extensive chronic ear disease where uh, endoscopy allows us to identify the area of the eustachian tube and finding that in this area, we have a unexpected obstruction and obliteration of the eustachian tube opening by a membrane. And uh, this really um, would be really difficult to see under microscopy. So one of the key factors and ideal indication for, um, for endoscopy is really the approach to a cholesteatoma, in particular to attic cholesteatoma, where, uh, as you can see, the mastoid is not involved. And an attic cholesteatoma is particularly suitable for um, endoscopic approach. As you can see in this uh, uh, video, um, we can uh, extend our atticotomy. We use also um, we also use uh, um, additional tools, such as uh, this is a piezoelectric device that uh, drills under um, uh, saline. And uh, we show here that uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, view with a small aticotomy, the view of the, um, that we can see that uh, this uh, is a Prusak space cholesteatoma that did not extend the posterior to the ossicles. And uh, we can uh, perform a dissection. And uh, uh, in this case, um, uh, there was uh, um, it, the, the ossicular chain was still intact. And so by, uh, uh, we can remove this, uh, um, um, this cholesteatoma, keeping intact the ossicular chain, exploring the area of the anterior epitympanum that was not involved, and uh, um, this area of the tympanic segment and the, the retrotigman uh, and the posterior uh, sinus area, and uh, perform a more conservative surgery. And of course, another indication endoscopically is really the approach to the sinus tympani. And as our prior attempt to visualize the sinus tympani was through a facial recess approach, you can see that when disease lies in the sinus tympani, a facial recess uh, approach does not really reach into this area. And all attempts in the end sometimes often uh, led to a canal wall down mastoidectomy. So you can see here that um, in this um, uh, case of a child with an extensive and very aggressive mesotympanic cholesteatoma, endoscopy allows not only the visualization of the sinus tympani area, but of the retrotympanic space, where we can see that uh, this uh, cholesteatoma had extended in the region of a round window and further extended in the region of a subcochlear canaliculus, which has uh, um, uh, which extends as an aerosol tract into the 
Petros apex with a really dangerous uh, close communication with a carotid artery. And so um, here you can see um, that we can use a curette and we can really inspect uh, very well the retrotympanic space. And so has endoscopy changed our indication for mastoidectomy? Yes, it has. Uh, we don't use cholest for cholesteatoma and sinus tympani or in apicholesteatoma, but yes, in, um, with mastoid with, when cholesteatoma extends to the mastoid, of course, and for cochlear implants, uh, there's still a role for mastoidectomy, cholesterol and mastoiditis or mastoid abscess. But what about the chronic mastoiditis with an antral block? Well, in chronic mastoiditis with an antral block, I would be hesitant nowadays to perform a mastoidectomy because if we have here a very, um, a, a very nice um, well pneumatized mastoid, I would rather uh, clean the mastoid area, the, the attic area, flush the mastoid and give a second chance for this uh, area to, um, especially once I have ruled out that there's no cholesteatoma. And so it's also um, starting to uh, visualize our middle ear system, the mastoid system, similar to a lung where all the alveoli and uh, of the lung and the surface area is uh, um, we have this uh, uh, comparison with the mastoid where stripping the entire mastoid um, would reduce the surface area. And similarly, in, uh, we've made a transition in sinus surgery. We do not longer do a cold well lack approach to strip the entire mucosa of the maxillary sinus, but we do a conservative, a conservative uh, osteomyetal complex. And as you can see here, uh, a year later of drilling a mastoid, what that led once uh, you strip all the mucosa on full um, obliteration of the mastoids by fibrous tissue. So uh, we're here now with, uh, does this patient need a mastoidectomy? Well, uh, uh, when, when we look at cholesteatoma, our first indication is um, looking at whether this can be approached transcanal. And in these two cases, yes, it can be approached transcanal, but in a cholesteatoma with a mastoid extension, we have to ask ourselves, uh, can we do it all transcanal? And there are limitations because once the cholesteatoma extends past uh, the region of the into the antrum, there are limitations. Of course, sometimes a very extensive cholesteatoma, you can see the edge, but you cannot remove it. And therefore, cholesteatoma, a mastoidectomy approach is also uh, necessary in addition to your endoscopic work. And after you do a mastoidectomy, your work is not done. We utilize the endoscope into the mastoid to explore and see blind areas, uh, such as the posterior aspect, the medial aspect of the external oil canal that we drilled, where we can find cholesterol that was not so easily visible under the microscope. And to end up, I mean, as endoscopy, yes, and, uh, eliminated the need for canal wall down mastoidectomy. No, there are still areas where a cholesteatoma that has an extremely high, um, extremely extension in a developed anterior attic with a very unfavorable sinodural angle with this low line tegment or a cholesteatoma that has extended beyond the time of re where we have a small mastoid, a low line tegment, a high riding sigmoid sinus. These are cases where a canal wall down is necessary. However, sometimes we can do in a very limited, um, in a very limited um, conservative um, uh, surgical approach, a transcanal endoscopic mastoidectomy. And here you can see the result of a limited approach that has spared all the removal of this bone. So to conclude, yes, endoscopy disrupted my surgery routine, but in a good way. And I'd like to leave you with this quote that I found on the internet, not all storms come to disrupt your life, some come to clear your path. And I'd like to also thank, um, um, I would like to give acknowledgement to Professor Presuti and Professor uh, Marchioni for uh, um, um, uh, all their teaching and allowing me to use uh, uh, the illustrations for this presentation from their book, Endoscopic Your Surgery. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shafina, for that fantastic um, discussion on endoscopic surgery and your practice. It's really wonderful to see the evolution of your practice and the rationale for how you switched from the microscope to the endoscope. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Jethanimus at NYU, and we look forward to your presentation on your experiences in New York on Heads Up Ear Surgery. Daniel, welcome again. Good morning. Good morning. 
thank you to everyone in the academy, uh, uh, Dr. Tarabichi, Dr. Lee, for this opportunity. Let me see. Let me get my screen up here. All right. Let's see. Is that looking good there? All right, perfect. So thanks again for the opportunity. So I was going to talk a little bit about how innovation can help us as ear surgeons uh, keep our heads up. Um, and here's a little sculpture, even the sculptures here in New York City at our hospital uh, keep their heads up, holding up a taxi cab there. Um, Dr. Lee gave a great uh, introduction and try to extend on that. I have no financial disclosures that are relevant to this talk. Um, you know, we're all, of course, used to um, heads up surgery in the other fields of otolaryngology. So, you know, in rhinology, sinus surgery, and all of our other subspecialty fields, uh, we're very much used to working off of monitors and the displays. And endoscopic ear surgery, as Dr. Fina just showed us, uh, has amazing benefits and also allows us to keep our heads up during the middle ear portions of cases. But what about the mastoid? You know, that still pretty much remains the, the mainstay for microscopes because they provide us great magnification, stability, illumination, and line of sight views when we're in a more open field. Um, you know, I think that exoscopes, as Dr. Lee uh, showed us, are the way to kind of keep a heads up view throughout the case and they can be complementary to those endoscopic portions of the case. Um, so this is uh, my boss, Chairman, Dr. Tom Rowland. He's working pretty standard, traditional microscope view, pretty good posture and ergonomics. And you can see, you know, the, the tech staff is kind of looking around. We have some trainees watching over there as well. And I think we'll see in some pictures how exoscopes might be able to change the dynamic in the operating room, uh, just change the real paradigm for us. Um, this is my home institution, so NYU in New York City, our uh, outpatient site. Show a couple images just of how um, some endoscopic ear surgery might be set up. One of our fellows uh, working here, so at least we have a monitor in front of us um, with a little bit of a better ergonomic view. Um, but if we did have to bring in a microscope, I think that can lead to a little bit of, um, you know, just a lot of manipulation in the OR in terms of the workspace, um, bringing in a microscope over moving the monitors and getting the team set up. So how can exoscopes help us? And what are exoscopes? So Dr. Lee already showed us, they're extracorporeal video microscopes. So typically a very high definition camera mounted to an articulating arm or a robotic arm. And the image of these exoscopes is displayed on a large monitor, typically uh, nowadays a 3D monitor at 4K. And they're meant to substitute for the traditional binocular operating microscope. And they've really gained traction in a lot of other surgical subspecialties, spine surgery, neurosurgery. Um, you know, our colleagues are um, really early on using these in different cases, uh, as well as microvascular surgeons. And so I think they have a lot of applicability to our field. Um, this is just a review of some of the systems um, you know, that I could find. I'm sure there may be others, and they all have their own nuances and features. Um, the one that I just personally have some initial experience with is the Olympus Orbi, the first one here, but they mostly share the similar idea of presenting a very high quality image on a monitor in front of the surgeon. Um, they can have either manually placed arms or many of them have robotic arms, which are not unique to just exoscopes. There are robotic arms and robotic elements of microscope systems as well. And they can be, uh, you know, they can be trained to track instrumentation or move based upon verbal commands as well. Um, they all have optical zoom and some have digital zoom uh, as well. So uh, these are just a variety of the examples of those systems. And so if we're thinking about exoscopes, I think uh, these are some of the things that I would think of and just informally talking to the team here, some of the neurosurgeons and the other neurotologists, what are we looking for out of an exoscope? Um, of course, we're looking for great visualization. And it seems that most studies find that it is very close to uh, a microscope or adequate for many portions of the procedure. But as Dr. Lee mentioned, it's, it's very hard to beat the actual visualization of a microscope. And then what does it do for us in terms of ergonomics? I think this is where it has a huge uh, win for us, you know, as surgeons and for the entire uh, team in the operating room, this is where it really has some benefits as well as in education and training. And so we'll take a look at some of those things as well as how they might change the workflow in the operating room. So 
as far as visualization goes, you know, we want to know how is that view? And I think um, just talking to the folks here, uh, as we've used it, the, the image quality was impressive. I think much more impressive than we might have thought um, right up, up front. I mean, that 3D um, view that you get with the glasses on really gives you a great uh, image quality. Um, you know, focusing and depth of field seem to be very good. Magnification um, is good up to a certain limit. I think many of us found and many of the papers from other literature has found that at the very high end of that magnification view, um, things can become a little grainy. I think that where that may be where the limits uh, may be, but as technology improves, that may be where this can uh, overtake some elements. Um, illumination and angles are, are good with the exoscope. I think with angles, what I mean is those cases where, you know, you are contorting your own body to some degree. You have a patient with uh, neck disease and you're trying to do a cochlear implant in an elderly patient and you're trying to move that table and your microscope to get a good view of what you have to get to, um, I think the exoscope you can move into any direction while you maintain your neutral posture. Uh, so some comparisons from the literature, um, you know, systematic reviews in the neurosurgical literature have mostly found that there's good agreement that the image quality magnification and that the field is, is equivalent to microscopes. Um, in many surveys. Um, however, many felt that that overall depth perception of stereopsis is not quite as good. Um, in the comparison from Italy of an exoscope to an operating microscope in lateral skull-based surgery, uh, there were no real differences in the small comparison series, and it was really feasible to use this for these lateral skull-based approaches. Um, in a more recent study where they compared an exoscope to an operating microscope, really for middle ear work, which I think a lot of us will, would prefer endoscopes for, but they did compare stapes and tympanoplasty. Um, you know, they kind of pointed out some of these shortfalls um, where they're in the deeper regions with a narrow corridor, uh, less light, there's some suboptimal depth perception there and some conversion rate to a microscope though low. And then, oh, here's an example image from that paper, uh, just in terms of what things might look up, look like at the maximum magnification, in terms of a little bit of graininess there compared to a binocular operating microscope. And then in a comparison in parotid surgery, which is actually a randomized study, I didn't find a lot of randomized studies with an exoscope, um, you know, to compare the two modalities and overall found no real differences in image quality at visualization in a more open field of different anatomic structures. Um, but interestingly, they did find in terms of outcomes, just a higher rate of transient facial palsy. It's unclear if it's directly related, but they do mention perhaps some learning curve and that reduced depth perception could contribute. So here's a system that we had used, the, the Orbi. It's very easy with that, you know, easy camera to move around manually with one hand, and then the surgeon and the team will wear uh, glasses with polarization so that you can see the 3D uh, monitor. Um, you know, just as Dr. Lee had pointed out in the height of the pandemic, when we did have to pursue some malignancy and oncologic cases, we did uh, write up um, how to use this with PPE on and using those polarizing filters outside of face shields if needed. And others have also uh, discussed their use of this um, when we do want to contain aerosol generating procedures. Uh, I wish I could show the audience really the wonderful 3D images that you can get, um, but I can't through the webinar um, you know, uh, format here. Uh, but this is just an example of a video. Uh, this is a right ear, this is a, a facial nerve drill out here. We're just stimulating the nerve for an oncologic procedure. Um, but this is what the exoscope is capturing, right? So there's a, a video system with your left eye, your right eye slightly uh, apart. And um, these are presented on a singular monitor, of course, that you see in 3D on the screen. Now, something really interesting would be that we can record these and then you can play these back if you have VR goggles or even just a little piece of cardboard with your phone, Google Cardboard or other phone accessories, you can rewatch these um, in 3D. So that makes for excellent recording and perhaps um, for future uh, training uh, of interesting cases and surgeries. So ergonomics um, we had heard about, I think this is kind of a, a huge portion of keeping your head up for us as surgeons. You know, surgeons, I think we will overlook ourselves as we treat our patients, um, but many studies from all over the world have really shown that otolaryngologists, otologists, neurotologists will report musculoskeletal symptoms from prolonged surgeries, um, long operating room days, 
And really for otologists, I think that neck flexion um, and how you are basically tied to the microscope uh, will contribute to this. Um, you know, the rates of this vary, but I think certainly we know there is some rate and, you know, we are completely one with the microscope if we want to look at a certain angle. If you want to swing up and look at the tag bin where we need to uh, look down, you need to move yourself with that microscope and you're limited by that. So the exoscope would allow you to overcome that, um, that component. So here's just a, a picture of one of our former uh, residents um, when we're using it. And I think we look pretty relaxed. We can keep uh, a pretty neutral posture. I certainly don't have the greatest ergonomics myself, uh, but I think this allowed for just a natural uh, ability to keep yourself in a, a good, uh, both open field in front of you without the stack of the microscope in front of you, as well as uh, a good posture while you're sitting and without your arms extended. And I'm borrowing the same images from the paper from Dr. Lee and Dr. Uh, Flavio Nagura. So he had already shown this, but I think it's just a stark comparison between uh, the positions of the same surgeon uh, doing a similar thing. And as he has shown, they had shown from that survey that there's subjective reduction in neck strain from the use of the exoscope. So it's a great complement. You know, you can use your endoscopes for the middle ear and then the exoscopes for any open approaches in the mastoid or for the lateral skull base. Um, and these also allow for, I think, just fantastic education and training. You know, here at an academic institution with fellows, uh, residents, and medical students, um, I think they are the ones who really rave about these kind of head up approaches because they really then share in that experience with you. You know, I know that when you're teaching under a microscope, if you have a fellow and a, a resident scrub, and you like to point out or discuss what they're seeing, you're looking at a 2D monitor, you don't have the same depth that they do. And even when you're pointing to that screen and pointing out anatomy and instructing them, they'll have to raise their heads from their microscope uh, to look over, reorient to what you were discussing, and then go back and forth. But with the heads up monitors for endoscopes and exoscopes, we can talk about the same thing together. So that discussion is really tied together. And of course, those in the room will also have that 3D benefit um, as well. So I think in terms of teaching and education, this is a, a huge win. Um, I think it also gives you some confidence also while you're supervising trainees as well. And this would um, also extend really to the to the whole team, right? This isn't just your uh, trainees, but, um, you know, I think I just snapped in this picture in one case, I think you just get engagement from everybody. So uh, surgical techs understanding the operations and being to anticipate and be a part of the procedure. Even the anesthesiologist will look over occasionally and see what's going on. So I think um, these types of heads up environments really engage everyone in the team and have the team work together, which uh, we all know can really make for much smoother surgeries. In that uh, OR workflow, uh, these devices do technically have a smaller footprint and are easy to set up. Um, I think Potentially that could be slightly offset depending on how many large monitors you may have to bring into the room. Um, and then they do allow you to have a much less obscured surgical field. Passing instruments don't have to go around uh, that stack of that microscope. Um, and then I know at least for me, when I move back and forth between an endoscope for the middle ear and a microscope for the mastoid, there shuffling of equipment, movement of the monitor, positioning of the surgical tech in terms of where they'll be best to pass instruments. I think if you have a clean setup between the two, certainly that's where you can have a lot more fluidity between um, elements as we would love to use the endoscope middle ear, work in the mastoid, use the endoscope in the mastoid and move back and forth between these elements. I think um, this can make for that uh, smoother transition. Oh, and then costs, uh, that can certainly vary, but many of these devices can be low cost and lower than many microscope systems, but that can vary from uh, device to device. Um, so I want to keep it short. Um, you know, inclusion, I think exoscopes across many fields have been shown to be very safe and effective for most elements of procedures. Um, you know, they can be great combinations with endoscopic approaches for otologists and neurotology procedures. I think some of those benefits we talked about really do stand out, um, but some of the drawbacks really are at that high magnification and with depth perception, which is very important, certainly for many of the things that we do. And I think some of those benefits are great for us as surgeons in terms of ergonomics, reducing fatigue, and uh, for education. But then some of the future I think we'd have to look at is really how does this move forward approaches or does it move forward some safety or uh, efficiency or outcomes for patients uh, themselves as most 
are looking at just non-inferiority uh, at the time. Uh, thank you very much. These are my daughters. They're going to get an early jump start on their endoscopic training. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that fantastic uh, presentation. Cute kids, by the way, too. And uh, I loved your quote from Tupac Shakur. I didn't know he said that, but I may have to uh, grab that quote from you and, uh, and recycle it again. Uh, so well done. Our final presenter or anchor speaker um, is, of course, Jean Flavio Nogueira from Fortaleza, Brazil. And he'll be speaking on the future of endoscopic and exoscopic ear surgery. Joao, welcome again. Hello. Hello, Dan. Hello, Dr. Pablo. Hello, Manuela. Hello, Danielle from New York. Excellent presentations, by the way. And we are going to talk a little bit about the future, what I think is going to be the future of, of uh, ear surgery, not only endoscopic ear surgery. I have nothing to disclose. And of course, today, 9-11, I could not uh, 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 is to say about the, the tragic day 20 years ago. So my condolences to all the, the lives lost and all the families that had uh, some uh, impact with that uh, terrible day. So I'd like to start with this quote of Socrates. It said, the secret of change is not to fight, to, to put our energy uh, to fight with the old, but to try to build the new. So to try to build the future is to try to understand the present and the needs that we need to have, but also to create some new needs. Uh, and to create a new future without fighting, because it's not a fight between endoscope, exoscope, or microscope. They, these are very fine instruments that can uh, help us to have to provide a best, a better healthcare for our patients. The same thing, the same discussion happened in sinusurgery, and nowadays no one says endoscopic sinusurgery. Everyone says sinusurgery because uh, the instruments, the endoscope, is already incorporated into the practice without any questions anymore. Uh, but of course, for that to be included, we had some uh, uh, interesting things or some uh, anecdotes such as uh, trying to smoke or having to smoke during the OR to try to understand the mucociliar clearance. So at that time in the 1970s, in the 1980s, you could actually smoke into the OR. You can see this doctor is smoking. Uh, he holds the, the cigarette with like a, <laughs> an instrument. And of course, this uh, helped with the future, but no, no one is going to smoke in the OR again, of course. And uh, this is a, a movie of Dr. Sternberger in 1986, where he did the second endoscopic Yesterday sinusurgery course. This is his voice. Do the dissection and the diagnosis on the in left Baltimore side. So. With Dr. D uh, David Kennedy. And as you can see, the image quality at the time in the 1980s, the quality of the endoscopes at the time, uh, the, the, uh, the quality was not good. So, uh, of course, uh, a lot of complications. But nowadays, we have a crystal clear cameras, crystal clear endoscopes, and things that I call the game changers. Uh, the microscope, uh, especially in ear surgery, uh, the drills, the cochlear implantations, the endoscopes, the cameras. But we always have to understand and look back into the past because of the pandemic, we still needed to do some mastoidectomy because we we're afraid of the aerosolization of the virus and using the drill. We had to do mastoidectomy with uh, chisels and hammers. And I like history very much. I have some historical movies. And as you can see in this case here, this guy is doing a mastoidectomy with a chisel and a hammer. And I could see those movies and I could understand and I could perform some surgeries uh, in the middle of the pandemic uh, of automastoiditis like, uh, like this with the, the, the chisels and the hammers. But of course, I consider that we are in the second endoscopic ear surgery era, thanks to Dr. Tarabishi, our godfather, that I always like to put this image, because nowadays we have good endoscopes, good cameras, HD cameras, 4K cameras uh, with filters, digital uh, imaging. So we have a lot of, of instruments, a lot of things that made us understand, first of all, the anatomy, then showed uh, beautiful slides about the middle ear anatomy, but also the principles, the physiology, the ventilation pathways, the ventilation routes, and all the physiology that leads to have inflammatory conditions such as tympanic perforations, uh, chronic mastoiditis, uh, cholesterol retraction pocket cholestatomas, and understanding the position of the tympanic isthmus, Manuela showed very well, we can understand that the ventilation pathways that we have in the middle ear, this is a very interesting picture because here we see lateral, superior, inferior, and here is medial. So you see here the malleus, the tympanic membrane, the endoscope is positioned at the station tube long process of the incus and then the stapes. 
can you operate the, the, the ear through the nose? Yes, you can, but it's not smart. This is a dissection that I went through the nose into the ear. So you can see here the space, the tympanic isthmus between the cochlear form process and the equal joint. And look, it's a very small space. So if you have any granulation tissue, a cholestetoma, a, a, a fibrotic a tissue from uh, enotitis, acute otitis media, you can close or you can reduce the space of this tympanic isthmus and you can have pressure changes and these pressure changes can lead us to uh, disease to inflammatory disease and this is not new dr tarano palva dr ramsey they had said that a lot uh, many years ago but with the microscope is very difficult to see and with the, the endoscope at the other hand is more easy with the endoscope we could see a lot of things for instance this is a case of a cholesteatoma it's a left ear anterior is here posterior, superior, and inferior. We are cleaning, and as you can see, we are using curved instruments. Now we are removing the heads of the malleus, and then we can see here the cochleariform process, and also when we clean a little bit the cholesterol from the supratubal recess, we can see the tensor fold here. The tensor fold is this web here that closes this anterior ventilation pathway, and then we can open during this, the, the procedure uh, to improve the ventilation after uh, the surgery. So we can open the tensile fold and then we communicate the supratubal recess and the station tube through uh, here, this uh, position. Also, we can understand the vision of the sinus tympani that we can have, and also the, the red blood cells that we can see, the mucociliar clearance, everything we can see nowadays with the endoscopes in a very, very close up view uh, to understand that. Uh, we can clean, see the station tube, the protympanic areas to see if it's open, see the sinus tympani, clean the uh, round and the oval window niche, uh, the sinus tympani in this position here, using curved instruments, of course, and instruments that are being developed for this kind of procedures. And of course, after we reconstruct, we can also see the position of the cartilage that we put. One thing is still a blind uh, area, this area here. We are transmastoid here with the endoscope and this medial part of the scutum is blind. We cannot see through the middle ears uh, through a transcanal approach. So every time you have doubt that you leave cholesterol on the medial part of the scutum, either you do a big, a big articotomy or you do a combined approach, a transmastoid approach, and then you can see and you can clean and put instruments through the mastoid and through the middle ear and clean. And after you reconstruct, it's interesting. After you put the cartilage uh, in the in the in the for the reconstruction, you can go, go transmastoid. This is the lateral semicircular canal. This is the cochlear form process. This is the cartilage that we put. This is the station tube. And you can check the ventilation pathways that you create after you do the procedure in real time, of course. And this is open. We do not use a lot of gel foam because we think the gel foam provokes a lot of inflammatory response and some fibrotic tissue that can close these ventilation pathways that we just opened during the surgery. So this is very interesting, but what about the future? Uh, the PricewaterhouseCoopers in 2019 said that the, the healthcare growth in the world is 6% per year before the pandemic. I don't know uh, the uh, data after the pandemic, but the education in healthcare growth is about 32% per year. So everyone now is uh, 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 thirsty for education. So we need to have courses, more courses, more uh, uh, educations like grand rounds, virtual grand rounds. Internet nowadays has revolutionized uh, the way that we understand and the teaching is not uh, new we can have uh, dissection courses since the times of the temporal bones and since the times of uh, uh, that position uh, of course we are talking about heads up procedure and heads up surgery and uh, talking about microscopes and exoscopes the industry still has to catch up with some instruments that has uh, brought a lot of instruments for us uh, nowadays but we still need uh, more instruments uh colibri is a new of them and a disposable endoscope with a suction embedded on the, on the instrument uh the cameras the 3d endoscopes uh, and of course, with the digital cameras, we can understand also the futures, using digital futures to try interoperatively in real time, understand if that tissue is cholesteatoma or not, or if this, uh, we are leaving cholesteatoma or not during the surgery, during the procedure. And of course, uh, the use of uh, uh, other types of intelligent artificial, this is 
uh, the autonomous car from Tesla. And this is uh, the, the way that Tesla, the car sees the world, sees the roads and sees the things. We can, we had a very interesting grand rounds in Harvard and we can incorporate this uh, artificial intelligence into surgery. And nowadays with uh, uh, programs that we have like Osirix or like uh, Horus, we can uh, segment the, the malleus, the facial nerve. We can do virtual endoscopy and we can understand uh, in real time if there is a blockage of the isthmus before we go into surgery and try to have to plan the surgery better. And in the future, maybe autonomous surgery. Why not? with uh, robots and uh, augmented reality also incorporated into the image guidance system. We can have this as a sinus, but also we can have uh, approaches to the inner ear. Manuela showed a very nice approach to the Petrus apex, but there is the transpromontorial approach to the inner ear uh, and the limits. We don't still have limits. We are trying to figure out the limits of endoscopic and both exoscopic and microscopic techniques that we can see. And talking a little bit about the exoscopes, I've used the exoscopes sometimes, but I think we are not ready for the prime time yet because of the evolution uh, of, of the digital quality. Nowadays, we have uh, 4K cameras. I use the 4K cameras for dissection. This is a camera from Olympus and we can have very interesting images, including using the filters of those 4K cameras and 4K dissections. But uh, our eye, the human eye is about 48K. And the microscope uses uh, glass uh, as a lens. It doesn't use any digital filters. So we still need some uh, improvement from uh, the uh, 8K or 12K or 16K that we have nowadays to 48K, which is our human eye. But of course, we have a lot of technology. Uh, Robotol, which is a new uh, robotic uh, device that you can use for ear surgery. The robotics, I think, are going to come into ear surgery, into sinus surgery, of course, uh, by the way. This is the robotic scope. It's very nice. This video is from Dr. Robert Vinson. He uh, provided me with this video because it's a, a robotic arm that moves with our head movements and has some goggles to, to have a 3D image. And then you control the arm with your head movements. So it's very nice. You can uh, put uh, sideways and back and forth. And you can understand and you can see it's like an exoscope. And of course, you have a better uh, ergonomics when compared to the traditional microscope. So it's Brazil's very has been using tilapia skin to treat burns for years now. Decrease the scar. This is part of a project of mine, the use of the tilapia skin and use of, of, of other biomaterials to close tympanic perforations. And Harvard uh, nowadays have a, another type of printed device or printed material that you can use to close perforations. So this is a very interesting thing that you can have uh, in the future. But of course, every innovation, you have the positive hype and the early adapters. Sometimes uh, these innovations are not going to be uh, part of our practice, but sometimes part of those innovations are going to be part of our practice. I think we just need to understand that health, our health is priceless. But healthcare has a cost. And sometimes when you put technology into uh, medicine, we increase the cost. With endoscopic ear surgery, it was different because we put technology, but we actually reduce the cost of healthcare for our patients and for our system if we have a public healthcare. So thank you very much for your time and let's go to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, João Flavio. Another fantastic uh, presentation about uh, the future of our field of heads up surgery. I wanted to transition to our um, panel discussion and uh, in the next 25 to 30 minutes. And so with that, let me go ahead and cue that up. And begin with a recent publication that I discussed actually at their recent AAONO meeting that was held virtually via London earlier uh, this week. And this was a study that looked at endoscopic ear surgery trends in Germany, a survey on the current situation and international uh, comparison. Uh, authors were Müller et al. 2021 in the German journal HNO. And so in the study, just to briefly conclude uh, what they um, found was, first of all, of the 27 clinics that were initially queried, 60% uh, stated that endoscopic ear surgery was used as an accompanying measure to the traditional microscopic approach. Of those clinics who responded, only one center, one clinic, actually had a surgeon performing ear surgery endoscopically exclusively for middle ear cases, so only one. What was interesting is that um, 
And about 50% of those who responded, uh, there was a belief that the necessary resources for endoscopic ear surgery were estimated to be higher than for microscopic ear surgery, which is, I think, an interesting observation simply because I would imagine that all German operating rooms have endoscopes and towers and ear instrumentation. And as we all have learned, you can begin these approaches without having to buy any single new piece of equipment. So this is, I think, a perception that we need to continue to help address and clarify. And I think to conclude, which I think is the most important observation, and I wanted to get the, the, the panel to weigh in, only four out of 45 responding clinics rated the future significance of endoscopic ear surgery in Germany as high. So Germany, first world country, where we see the origins of our own specialty back in the day, who developed all the modern Hopkins route telescopes, only four out of 45 believe that this is actually an important surgical Trend. And so with that, I wanted to have the panelists weigh in, starting with uh, Dr. Fino. Uh, what do you think are the uh, hurdles for widespread adoption? I mean, you have a major country with a lot of innovative surgeons there, and yet this field is still quite fledgling, quite young, much like endoscopic science surgery faced some difficulty back in the 80s and 90s. Um, hello, Dan. Well, um, to answer, yes, I'm a little bit surprised about uh, um, uh, your, your findings. I think it's intrinsic to surgery itself because, uh, uh, first of all, um, once we're taught something in a certain way, uh, we tend to follow our teachings, and it's really hard for a surgeon to start a new technique because starting a new technique. Um, it's a little bit starting from scratch. There could be uh, some difficulty and you have to invest a little bit of a time and a little bit of uh, humbleness in starting a new technique that may be challenging. So uh, most of uh, the cases, um, it's uh, endoscopic surgery is going to start from generation to new generation. We are training the new generation of residents. And so in the next five years, uh, we will see a change because uh, our residents are taught endoscopic surgery along with sinus surgery and along with uh, um, just how they, they learn. But starting from uh, current surgeons to grab the endoscope when you're trained with a microscope all your life, maybe a little bit of, a, of an obstacle. That's where the challenge is. Daniel, any thoughts on this recent study? How, does, how do these observations um, coincide or align with what's happening in North America? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very surprised I hadn't seen that study before. I think um, in particular, just the, the question about uh, what you would think would be the future of endoscopic surgery. I think the current state is one thing, but as Dr. Fina said, I think there'll be a transition phase. But, um, you know, new incoming uh, residents and graduating fellows and trainees, um, I find that they take to the endoscope wonderfully because it's so natural for them to use it in the ear as it would be in the other portions of otolaryngology. And so I think they would be going out and utilizing it as a tool and they would think of ear surgery uh, as endoscopic or microscopic. It's just the way they would do it. Um, in North America, I'm not sure. I mean, m my feeling is that there's much wider acceptance, I think, uh, just with many more programs having endoscopic surgeons, uh, training uh, residents and, and fellows going out. Uh, I feel like it'll just be a, a clean transition and not nearly as much of a pushback against it. Even those who are pretty, um, you know, my partners who are, are world-class surgeons and trained with a microscope, um, you know, they'll even pull out a, a endoscope here and there for some usage. So I think, um, you know, it has pretty wide acceptance from, from what I've seen. I would love a photograph of either Sean or Tom using an endoscope in the ear. Can you please send that to me? I would love to use it in a talk. Uh, quick antidote, which Tom will, will verify. He said he used endoscopes decades ago to try to do second looks through small incisions in the mastoid and he's been a, a big um you know a supporter of the use of them but just hard to kind of completely break your old habits i'm sure absolutely well, he's a phenomenal surgeon so and uh joe flavio in brazil and south america and globally you've you've seen it all so just to briefly respond to this interesting study and findings yeah, it's, it's very interesting, but it's not surprising to me because some countries, especially some European countries, they have a very hierarchical uh, uh, system of, 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 of teaching and of uh, doing uh, healthcare, providing healthcare. So Germany probably is one of them. And uh, in sinus surgery, the same thing happened. The same thing actually happened. And I think uh, 
as many more people use throughout the world, especially in countries like Brazil, in countries in the third uh, world, uh, uh, because of the costs, uh, it's going to be a, a thing that's going to be outside in, and uh, many people is going to, to, to use the endoscopes in the future. Great. So, obviously, we know the endoscope is fantastic for examining the ear. Otoendoscopy in the office is a great way to get started if you haven't tried it uh, yet in your otology practice or in your general practice in which you see ears. Uh, great for documentation, great for communicating with your patients and referring uh, physicians. Um, Manuela, this is a left ear uh, with um, a tympanic membrane abnormality. Would this be a good case for an endoscopic approach? Um, well, yes. So I see that in this tympanic membrane, um, there is a, a mesotympanic uh, retracted tympanic membrane with a very fragile uh, tympanic membrane. You can see the difference between the anterior half that has a more of a uh, texture of a little bit of normalcy, while the uh, inferior half is not only retracted, but very atrophic. So this is a year that looks easy, but is not easy because uh, you can see that there is a prominent uh, anterior canal and uh, we have to elevate all the this atrophic tympanic membrane of the retrotympanic space. So um, yes, um, absolutely. If you would approach microscopically, I think that your uh, attempts would be unsuccessful. You would maybe attempt a facial recess approach to see how far did the epithelium track down. Uh, Daniel, this is a case certainly in my practice. I trained with trad traditional otologists, John DeParco, Lloyd Minor. Larry Lustig, and uh, this would be a posterior lateral graft and panoplasty, unquestionably, and that's how I did it for a number of years. Do you think this is a good case for at least an experienced endoscopic surgeon to tackle transcanal, or would you favor a posterior approach in this particular instance? Um, I think transcanal endoscopic would be uh, just fine for someone experienced and comfortable with it. Um, I think the endoscope really gives you that view anteriorly and so you know I routinely I don't think I've done a postricular tympanoplasty in, in many many years you can certainly access the anterior components whether you like to do some lateral grafting or underlay grafting I mean whichever tricks you like to use cartilage or not uh, you certainly can access those areas endoscopically and in fact I think it's it's better I mean I think you can see that anterior half uh, wonderfully raise flaps however way you would like to and place your graft. So I certainly think it's very accessible with the endoscope and I would certainly prefer it actually. Joao, do you think this pathology would be an ideal approach for an endoscopic approach and why? Well, uh, this is, uh, seems to be a left ear, uh, anterior in the left, uh, posterior, superior and inferior. And uh, uh, you can see like a, a pearl, uh, probably skin pearl in the attic region uh, going more anterior. You have a canal overhang uh, anterior that uh, can uh, limit the access through the ear canal, especially if you're using a speculum and a microscope or an exoscope. But I think with a, a good uh, uh, endoscope, a three millimeter endoscope and uh, a guy that is, or a girl that is uh, a little bit experienced with endoscopic uh, ear surgery, the eye-hand coordination, it can be done. Uh, you have to raise uh, bigger tympanometal flaps anterior to that pearl ball and uh, elevate and try to di dissect this uh, cholesteatoma probably, and to remove and try to reconstruct if you need, if the ossicular chain is eroded. But I think it's a, a very feasible case for endoscopic ear surgery. But as I say, it should not be a first case, of course. Uh, there is a learning curve. And probably this is one of the problems of Germany, uh, that Germany study. Sometimes you have very experienced surgeons, very experienced with microscopes, very good, excellent surgeons with microscopes, but they never touched an endoscope in their life. So if they want to start this surgery, they can do this with a microscope of a retroauricular approach, like in 10 minutes. But if they want to do with the endoscope at, as their first surgery, probably they are not going to uh, achieve the goal and they are going to be frustrated. And sometimes it's easier to blame the instrument and not yourself. And what do you think the diagnosis is here, John Flavio? Uh, probably it's a congenital, maybe a congenital cholesteatoma. I don't know. Indeed. And that's what it was. This was an 18 month old uh, male infant whose astute pediatrician identified a mass uh, behind the eardrum. So hats off to the referring physician. 
not an ENT, but a primary care physician. Uh, this is a case of a 38-year-old uh, gentleman, an otologist with an attic cholesteatoma who waited uh, for the field to advance before considering surgery for his own left ear. And so I think ideally, as many of you have learned, uh, is an ideal case for a transcanal endoscopy approach. This disease uh, was adherent to many aspects of the middle ear, including the facial nerve and remnant ossicular chain, but did not um, go past the horizontal canal. And so this was uh, removed through a transcanal approach. I strongly encouraged a second look procedure in this particular case, uh, but he said he didn't want another operation. And so his partners examined the ear every six months for him. So, um, and then finally, Dr. Fina, this is a 27 um, year old woman who presented with a conductive hearing loss and the referring uh, physician thought it was otosclerosis. So could you briefly take us through your findings here and what you think we might need to do? Well, I see a tympanic membrane with opacity in the middle ear and this worrisome crusting in the region of a pars flaccida that is highly suspicious for a large cholesteatoma of the epitympanic space that has extended in the middle ear portion and in a difficult area to dissect the anterior epitympanic space and the mesotympanic space overlying completely the region of the ossicles. That makes me concerned that the ossicles may be involved at almost 360 degrees. We don't know the location, the location of the stapes. So definitely um, this needs a CT scan to understand the extension of the cholesteatoma, whether it extends into the mastoid. I would start endoscopically and then according to the extension in the mastoid, follow the pathway of disease and probably um, uh, have to do a mastoidectomy depending on the extension. I see also that the extension extends a quite superiorly instead of a posteriorly. And so I would be a little bit concerned about any tegment dehiscence in this area. So a CT scan is, uh, is imperative in this case. Uh, thank you, Manuela. And I enjoyed your, your slide that um, described how you used to do the mastoid component first and then the middle ear second. And that's exactly how I used to do my chronic ears as well. And the endoscope has flipped the order where we do everything transcanal initially with the injection being you know, fresh and, and working properly and doing the fine work first and then going to the bony work second. And in this case, we did a transcanal and transmastoid endoscopic dissection to preserve her ear canal. And, um, and then she's had a second look uh, after that um, and has had a, a disease-free ear thus far. And Danley, finally, is this a great uh, case to do uh, for an early endoscopist of the ear? This is an innocent looking mass of the uh, left middle ear on tympanotomy. Can you describe what you see and and uh, provide us with some guidance? Is that me? That's you. So so that looks, um, all right, sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, so, I mean, not so innocent looking, you know, for a early endoscopist, I think they're a little bit of a, a reddish hue and a potentially vascular lesion in the uh, inferred components of the middle ear, certainly very suspicious for a tympanic paraganglioma or glomus tympanicum. Um, although I think very approachable um, and endoscopically, since you can see the borders fairly well, and I think you raise a nice flap around it uh, with a variety of tools, you can control that, um, that lesion most likely, identify its blood source and excise it, um, certainly for an early endoscopist with um, the uh, potential for bleeding in the field and the agility with tools, maybe not your first case. And then a slightly more challenging one there uh, with the, uh, I don't know if it's the same case or it looks like a, a larger one there, no? But um, it's, I think you've shown it's here really nice. It's the same case. Same case, okay. So yeah. I think you've shown here really nicely how well the flap can be raised to get the exposure to it. Uh, and then, you know, control of that lesion, um, you know, in, in your preferred methodology. Once the annulus was lifted transcanal, the tumor pushed itself out. And um, so, yeah, and it looks beautiful until you actually touch it. And so, you know, the endoscopy approach is great for, for diagnosing and assessing and describing what you see. And then um, oftentimes if it's uh, large and complex, uh, one might have to use the microscope as well for the second hand for, for clearing the suction if you're using a Hopkins rod system. So. And so are one-handed procedures with the endoscope more difficult uh, than the microscope? And I think this speaks to a comment that was made by um, Dr. Corditas, who is a surgeon in Germany, who wanted to um, uh, highlight a, um, uh, a question about 
um, and microscopic versus endoscopic and the one-handed issue regarding time in the operating room. And so with that, I wanted to highlight just a, a brief case from my pediatric otology practice. So a lovely five-year-old, otherwise healthy female who failed hearing screening in her pediatrician's office. Her left ear on exam was entirely normal. And so Joao, looking at her axial CT series of the temporal bone, looking at the middle ear and mastoid anatomy, it's interesting because you can see the vestibule and you can see the stapes. It's a very, of course, a CT scan in a child, we always have some uh, problems. But uh, in this case, uh, I think the CT was very interesting and you could see a very good reconstruction, a very slight, uh, small cut CT. And you can see the stapes, you can see the ossicular chain, the mastoid as well, pneumatized. Uh, you can see the antrum, you can see the incus and the, the head of the malleus. Uh, you can see the cochlea, the facial nerve. It's very, very nice uh, CT scan. But of course, you you, you could, cannot see some uh, 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 lack of, of communication between the incus and the stapes. Huh? That was like a, a problem of malformation, a congenital malformation. So, uh, Dr. Fina, uh, the intake audiogram shows a conductive hearing loss in the left ear, mild to moderate loss, ear bone gap, excellent speech intelligibility, normal tympanometry, and absent reflexes of the left ear. And so this is the case, just to briefly to take you through elevating our flap with a traditional Rosen knife. So Dr. Fina, this is the finding on middle ear endoscopy following tympanotomy. Can you describe to the group uh, your impression and how you would manage this? And I will tell you before you say anything that the state piece is mobile, as is the malleus. Yes, so uh, on the middle ear endoscopy, it, I am not sure whether I see, it. so I, I'm looking at the long process of the incus and uh, uh, there's a couple of uncertainty here. Um, it, it looks like the, the, the most distal process of the incus that is called also the lenticular process. It seems like there's some sort of a discontinuity or a, a mucosal union between the lenticular process, the, the distal process of the incus and the capitulum. So I'd like to palpate that area and verify whether that is the area of discontinuity. Uh, Daniel, what do you think of your first glimpse of this ear? I'm sorry, that broke up. I missed that last part. What no, do so, I think? Yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, what are your impressions when you look at this image? What you... Yeah, I agree. I mean, there seems to be something uh, abnormal there in terms of the, the IS joint and the lenticular process. Um, you know, we know the stapes is mobile. So, you know, Papi and Shane, I would think that potentially there could be something uh, um, in terms of uh, the IS joint primarily with a variety of ways of uh, potentially uh, addressing that. So, so as, as accurately described by both Dr. Fien and Dr. Jathanimus, the long process of incus is intact, somewhat eroded or, or small, uh, underdeveloped. There's an absent otherwise remaining part of the long process of incus. So it's disconnected from the body of the incus entirely. And so as you saw from the intake uh, otoendoscopy, the eardrum looked entirely normal with no history of chronic otitis media. So this is a, either a spontaneous erosion of the incus or some sort of unusual um, embryological uh, anomaly, which might support the um, two branchial arch um, uh, theory on the origins of, for example, the incus. Uh, in any event, so uh, Manuela, how would you address this? What would be your way to reconstruct it? The rest of the osteoclet chain is normal, middle ear is normal, and the family obviously wants to improve and close the airborne gap as best as you can. What is your preferred technique given the findings here on this five-year-old patient here? So you have clarified that not only we have this discontinuity, but there is a large portion of the um, long process of the, of the incus that is missing. And so if we want to proceed to ossicular chain reconstruction, we have a different option. Um, um, my what do you do, pork? Pork or so my preferred uh, option would be a uh, incus interposition graft because uh, number one we have a viable uh, um, body of the incus that can be um, rotated and uh, uh, 
uh, interposed between the capitulum and the manubrium of the malleus. Um, the other option would be to interpose uh, one of the prostheses, such as an apple bomb, that keeps the integrity of the incus uh, to the um, to the stapes. But I'm concerned that that is too long of a of a missing piece to utilize a 2.5 millimeter um, apple bomb. So I would use the interposition grafter, just like you're showing right now. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Daniel, would you have used a porp, or would you have considered an interposition? And I sort of agree with. Dr. Fina, if the incus is healthy and there's no chronic ear disease history, if the geometry seems reasonable, would you use a incus under position or go right for a high-end titanium prosthesis? Uh, just my personal preference is typically prosthesis for the most part, just my own experience and consistent results with that over the interposition. Uh, but certainly I, I see the, you know, very good reasons to use an interposition as well when you have a, a healthy incus. Um, and it sounds like the nice thing is in this ear, it's a healthy ear otherwise with good ventilation. So, uh, you know, good, good options either way, I think. Of course, everyone loves the post-operative endoscopic bandage. It's called a cotton ball. And this is her post-operative uh, audiogram. So it's an example of, again, one-handed endoscopic ear surgery, which is uh, sort of how we use the Hopkins rod today. But it remains, I think, a concern that uh, a lot of our colleagues bring up is that I miss my second hand. And so, you know, is there a way forward? And um, so let's discuss just briefly the novel distal chip systems, which have been put forth to potentially overcome some of those challenges with a traditional one-handed Hopkins rod um, approach. And so these uh, distal chip systems um, project on a 2D screen. Uh, thank you to Dr. Dan Chu at Cincinnati Children's, who's a neurotologist and otolaryngologist in chief there, performing the first distal chip assisted ear surgeries in the United States. He was the first to, to adopt this technology. And so, uh, Dr. Dathanimist, any comments on distal chip technologies that are single use as opposed to multi use? Have you tried this before? And do you think this may be one way forward for some surgeons to overcome the one handed problem? So I've, I've only tried this in the lab, um, and I think it's it's very exciting. Uh, I think the ability to bring in a second hand is 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 really nice. Um, you know, I think um, just making sure that the image clarity uh, is as good um, and you know adequate on that end would be nice. Um, I think certainly this is the way forward. I think um, changing our instrumentation and armamentarium, just the tools that we have, will enable us to do more. Um, although we can do great things, uh, osteoplasty with one hand, having that extra hand can be certainly helpful in certain dissections, uh, for sure. Dr. Fina, any comments on single-use endoscopes? As you know, many hospitals are moving towards single-use end endoscopy in general because of the concerns of cross-contamination and cost of processing multi-use systems. Well, it's not good for the environment, but I understand the concerns and we have to keep pace with the technology. And I can see here that there are advantages with the suction. Uh, Joao, final comment on this technology before we have an extra minute or two to discuss a final case. I've never used it in, in practice. I only use in dissection. I think it's a, a great uh, innovation. But as Dr. Fina, I, I, I tend to be worried about disposables, about the carbon footprint and the cost. Sometimes uh, it increases the cost of, of healthcare for us here in Brazil. And so uh, just the final case here is uh, an 11 year old male patient in my practice with left-sided chronic otitis uh, media. And as you can see on autoendoscopy, a fairly unhappy, raging, infl inflamed, a left ear with a large oral polyp. And uh, Daniel, could you comment on the radiological findings? Sure, so we have a left ear coronal scan, looks like um, mostly well-developed, but opacified mastoid, uh, opacification there in the antrum. In the ear loud canal, it's uh, pretty good. Um, and then definitely some erosive properties there in the uh, epitympanic space coming over the osteocular chain um, without, and some, some blunting of the sputum there. Um, and then some of that soft tissue, I think that correlates with your um, otoendoscopy. Uh, Daniel, do you think you could do this transcanal endoscopically exclusively, or are you sensing that more may need to be done? 
definitely sensing more maybe need to be done there. So uh, this topic is really the role of transmastoid dissection. We're, we're so focused on the corridor of the ear canal as a way to take full advantage of the endoscope. But in fact, it's a beautiful instrument for visualizing the transmastoid corridor as Dr. Nogura highlighted in one of his uh, surgical clips as well. And so the way we use it in Boston is like this. We perform a canal up mastoidectomy following middle ear dissection of tumor or of cholesteatoma. I then place a small sponge to help stabilize the telescope so it doesn't bounce back and forth on the bony edge of your mastoid cavity. And then in doing so, you can deliver an angled telescope into the mastoid and beautifully visualize the middle ear anatomy from above, hovering, looking down. And as Dr. Nogura described, there are several areas of the bony surface in this area that you just cannot visualize at all with a transcanal approach. It would require a canal wall down approach of doing a microscopic assisted dissection. And so the anatomy is quite compelling and gives you a different glimpse of the same anatomy that you're used to seeing uh, time in and time out with your transcanal approaches. And so just to take you through the anatomy, this is the left ear in the surgical position. Uh, this is going to be superior, inferior, lateral, and medial, showing the undersurface of manubrium, the stapes superstructure, the TM, and you can beautifully see the undersurface of the drum with the fibrous annulus, and the chorda tympani nerve, which traverses just underneath the neck of the malleus before uh, projecting anteriorly uh, past the middle ear cleft. So don't forget that the transmaster approach, and especially for those who are learning ear endoscopy, is a great way to combine a microscopic and endoscopic approach to potentially save your patient a canal wall down mastodectomy. Let's see. Um, any uh, final comments from the panelists? The time is now 10.32. I believe we do have to finish on time although there are always more cases to discuss, but I just wanted to acknowledge and um, thank uh, the fantastic expertise afforded by our panelists today. Thank you very much, Dan, for the opportunity, and I hope uh, people have enjoyed the presentations and the discussion. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful presentation and all my co-panelists uh, uh, for uh, their outstanding presentations and all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you so much. I learned so much. Thank you to the organizers and for everyone who's attended. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, thank you Daniel, also for taking care of this, uh, this uh, session. And I have one big question for Dan Settinus. Uh, are your operating rooms so beautiful in New York? I mean, I've never seen more beautiful <laughs> operating rooms. <laughs> is this a wide angle camera or is it just deception or is it reality? <laughs> it's just a camera. It's all, it's all special effects, really. Reassuring. Bubble. Can you hear us, Pablo? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I. Uh, outstanding presentations and uh, we thank uh, the leadership of the academy uh, dr deneni for being here dr muaster avici chair elect of the international advisory board dr carl herman chair of the international advisory board and mark saferio who is the coordinator elect for international affairs and we uh, we also want to thank our wonderful staff uh, Rebecca Dobbins, which, who is our uh, Director of Global Affairs, and Elise Swinehart, Senior Director uh, of uh, Membership and Global Affairs for putting this excellent program together. Um, as Dr. Deneni uh, said, it, uh, we want to welcome everybody to our one tw 125th anniversary annual meeting in Los Angeles, either in person or virtually. Uh, it will be an outstanding program. I um, also want to invite all of you to the upcoming virtual global ground rounds, which will take place November 20th of this year on thyroid cancer, new treatment paradigms and technologies in 2021. Um, and uh, uh, mark your calendar, we, uh, the American Academy of Otolaryngology will be hosting the Pan American Congress of Otolaryngology in Orlando, Florida. June 25th through the 27th, and we'd love to have 
all of you participate. Uh, and I'd like to officially invite this panel uh, to be presented at the, at the Pan American Congress. It will be an outstanding uh, live presentation. And we'll be honored to participate, Pablo. Thank yeah, you. That'll be wonderful. And so uh, I was going to, my, my final thoughts are that building a, a global community takes a strong leadership and enduring commitment to growing and strengthening our specialty. And our experiences as physicians and members of the global community during this COVID-19 pandemic help us to see the importance of interpersonal connections and the importance of uh, understanding that takes all of us to build a vibrant global community. And one that is undaunted by the myriad of challenges posed by lockdowns, quarantines, and our travel restrictions. Certainly we have experienced firsthand the value of new communication technologies like this one and have benefited from uh, working across borders to better serve our patients during this pandemic. The American Academy of Otolaryngology and its foundation is committed to continue